Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of Extra Time TV. This is Andrew Sokal. We're here with James Baird on the avenue at Smokey and Bunty's in Trinidad and Tobago. But James, before we get started, I'm absolutely loving that jersey. Where did you get it from? Because a lot of people would like to know. So could you tell them? Well, I'm very, very grateful from this wonderful, beautiful Portugal jersey from our friends at Football Planet. Great fit. Great look, and it obviously got me ready for a great game. Yes, yes, folks. You know, if you want to get more of these jerseys, they sell the player fits, also the replicas, and so on. So you can check them out. They've been kind enough to supply us with them. So be sure to check them out. Grab some jerseys. The World Cup is going on. That's a place to be. So you know, moving along, we're going to head into the first game, James. Uh, you know, Cameroon started off this day with a 3-3 draw with Serbia. What a way to start the morning, James. What do you think about this game? Well, like I say, it was an absolutely fantastic day of football in general. We were treated to some beautiful goals, and this game never fell short at all. We had a wonderful goal from Abu Bakar. That was, it was like something from FIFA. It was mouth-watering, a nice chip over the goalkeeper. Chipo Matang got another great goal as well, with an assist again from Abu Bakar, who came on. And then we had some wonderful play from Mitrovic, Milenko Savic. It was just an epic game, and the scoreline obviously reflects that. Yes, yes, and you know, just uh, taking a quick look at the stats, it was 12, uh, 13 shots for Cameroon, 15 for Serbia, 8 on target for Cameroon, 5, you know, for Serbia, 40%, 60%, so it was back and forth, you know, the stats in a lot of ways don't reflect the real outcome of the game, it was pretty exciting and also, you know, both teams, you know, tactics-wise, let's pull up the formations, Rook Cameroon used 4-3-3. And, uh, you know, obviously Serbia used three at the back, which seems to be a formation that's back in style now, as we say in Fernando Tobago. I've always liked it. So, James, what do you think about the tactical approach of both teams? Well, the first thing I would say is one of the huge talking points that I noticed, or the points that I noticed, was the fact that Cameroon changed the goalkeeper. Obviously, being a goalkeeper myself, it popped up. It was very glaring to me. And Epassi came in. We know, obviously, the goalkeeper from your team into Milan, I think it is. Yes, Onana. He yeah. seems to be missing today. So I obviously read up on it, and it seems to be he had a, an altercation with the coach with the way he takes his goal kicks. Yep. Obviously, he wants to play it out from the back. His coach doesn't want that. He wants him to go long, and it has worked or it's ended up meaning that he's been expelled from the team. Mm -hmm. So a huge talking point. Did it reflect or have any reflection on the game? It maybe did with the amount of goals that were scored. Yeah. And, and obviously going into the tactical thing, like you say, the tactics allowed the game to be so open. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, to be honest, Serbia should have won the game. They were 3-1 up at one point. Correct. They should have been done and dusted. And I think their coach will be very disappointed he wasn't able to lock up shot. Right. And he didn't manage the game maybe well enough. And obviously, that substitution and bringing on Abu Bakar, who hasn't had the best of careers so far with um, Cameroon, but he lit up the show today with a goal and an assist. And he's got a great point on the, on the board for his team. Yes, yes, and you know, we'll discuss the group tables afterwards because it's taking shape, folks. It's taking shape. We're now knowing who's going to go out. Some people still have a chance. It's very complicated, so we'll talk about that. And, you know, folks, you can let us know what you think about the Onana situation. You know, Inter Milan fans and people in general, you know, uh, you're a coach, you're a player, you've been chosen to play for the World Cup. Your coach tells you you want to play that way. He says no. What do you think about that? Do you think the coach was right? Do you think the player was right? Who wins, who loses? Let us know what you think in the comment section below about that because, you know, we all know it's not just tactics, sometimes behind the scenes can make or break a team game. So, you know, as you mentioned, you know, do you think those sort of altercations affect a team's performance overall? I know you mentioned it before, but, you know, could it affect, you know, uh, Cameroon? Well, I think this is one thing that affected, is affecting a lot of the teams at the World Cup. We're hearing a lot of off-the-field altercations. We heard about the thing, with, for example, between Ronaldo and Fernandez, and then it was cleared up with the two of them that it wasn't really an issue. Obviously, this one seems to be, but it doesn't really matter what's going on off the field. What is what's most important is what's going on on the field. And we were treated to a six-goal thriller here, yeah. and the fans can't ask for any more than that. Yes, yes. So, you know, folks, you know, let us know what you think in the comment section about this game. We're going to head into the second game which was South Korea taking on Ghana folks and you know I have to lower my voice now because the music just changed but you know uh, the game ended uh, two, uh, three to two to uh, Ghana uh, this is a game that you know people were telling me that you know they think South Korea were really gonna with Son and those guys they were gonna bounce back unfortunately he was crying after the game uh, we saw a picture that was viral I'll probably put it up after we edit but uh, you know James three two let me know your thoughts on this game well, this again was a very, very close game, and, and South Korea will be very disappointed, especially with what happened at the end, but we'll come to that in a minute. Uh, I think 
kudos was absolutely fantastic and you have to give him his kudos because the Ajax man got two goals, fantastic performance. Salisa got the goal from the header. Cho got two goals for um, Korea, but it had so much action. I think, to be honest, for periods of the game, South Korea seemed to sit in and not drive forward and they waited till the end to then try and attack Ghana. To me, by that time, it was too little too late. And obviously, like I say, we'll talk about what happened at the end, but this was a game that Korea will be heavily disappointed they weren't able to get something out of. Yes, yes. And you know, once again, we're going to continue our trend. Uh, you know, we'd love to talk tactics for like a couple hours. We're going to try to summarize it for you all. So obviously, 22 shots, according to the data for uh, South Korea versus seven. Seven shots on target for South Korea. Three. Possession, 64 versus 36. So it just shows you once again, you know, like uh, they, they dominated possession according to these stats, even if you didn't see the game. This shows, you know, and then we'll take a quick look at the formations as well. South Korea had a 4-2-3-1 versus uh, it's same formation for both teams. So James, you know, tactically, based on the stats and what you saw in the game, one team clearly had more possession and attacked more, but the result went in the favor of the team that had less possession. So, you know, what do you think about that? Well, like I said, I mentioned it briefly at the start, I think the tactical changes had a huge bearing on this game. I thought um, Paulo Bento, um, he, he waited too late to, to, to try and force the game forward. I think um, his back line dropped off for periods of the game, but I think um, Ado, who's the coach of Ghana, just got it spot on. Yep. Like I say, um, Kudos was fantastic. He, I think he got one wonderful, wonderful whipped cross, um, and obviously he scored it, but... Um, it was there for South Korea to get something out of this. And, yeah. and obviously at the end, like I say, I said I was going to talk about it, Paulo Bento getting the red card yeah. because the referee blew the whistle as it was a corner to South Korea. So they had this chance. Um, he'll be heavily disappointed because he would have wanted that corner. Correct. And it ended up, or it resulted in him getting a red card. Mm -hmm. Obviously, emotions come into it. Yeah. He's again heavily disappointed, but I think Korea should have got more out of this game. Like I said, I thought Cho up front was fantastic. He got two wonderful goals, but he needed more players to support him. He didn't show up and obviously they're paying paying the price for it. Yes, yes. And you know, this is a thing, you know, you can let us know what you think as well, folks, because sometimes these a couple seconds in the game can make a difference. Do you agree? Do you disagree with his actions? As somebody, James, both of us have worked in professional and football in general. That's something we can relate to. You know, you're thinking, you know, you could have a chance. You're Trinidad and Tobago fans, that's where we're from. We all remember that 4-4 against Mexico, what could happen in that last corner of the game. Anybody who has watched football know that, you know, maybe, and you know, they were playing well. They were playing well. I think, Andre, one thing that will come into it, like that call by the referee at the end there. Yeah. One thing I noticed in a lot of today's games, the referees didn't have a huge hold over the game. For example, we'll talk about the Portugal game later, yeah. but the referee seemed to allow a lot of fouls. As I say, in this game, he did not allow that corner. I think South Korea should have been allowed to take the corner. Correct. I mean, they are in ascension at that time. They're going forward. They should have been allowed to do it, which would have obviously not resulted in the red card. And even the previous game, which we just spoke about, there was a moment where the whole um, technical bench ran on the field to celebrate the goal. Yeah. And the referee didn't know what to do. So yeah. because of VAR and these, this new technology in the game, it's maybe making referees feel less comfortable to make big calls. Yep. And this is like, I, I should say a, a subtopic from this topic because, you know, some people have been telling me, you know, off air, like, you know, we usually implement new technology during these sort of international tournaments. And yes, they're trials and they try them out. And I'm sure they do. But sometimes they're saying, you know, maybe it's not the best time to implement new technology. But when is the right time? You know, I guess it takes a period of, uh, you know, to adapt. So there's a love and hate for the new technology, including the offsides. Well, one thing I would say is the song coming on the bracket is Calm Down. And I think that's what Paulo Bento needed to do at the end there, you know. But he did not. And as I say, he got that red card. And that's football, like I say. <laughs> yes, yes. So unfortunately, you know, the result, uh, you know, didn't go their way. Son was not very happy. Uh, but, you know, before we uh, continue, we'll wrap up the groups towards the end, but we'll have a quick word from our sponsors from Biotech. So let's take a listen, folks. Biotech Plus is internationally certified for all clinical disinfection and sterilization, all infectious disease control and surgical instruments. And we're back, folks. So, you know, obviously, we're going to speak about the next game. But before we get started, folks, you know, James, we're always talking about that trip. We always try to throw it in there every couple seconds and let you all know there's a really good reason. Fantastic reason. I hate that word good. A fantastic reason for you all to come down for that trip to Tobago for two. James, tell us about it. Well, I was actually forgetting about it in case our fans forgot about it and then I won the trip, you know. But 
So anyway, as we say, come down here to Smoking Bunties on the Avenue and you get that wonderful chance to win a ticket for two to Tobago with our friends Adventure World Travels. Yes, yes. It's a great prize. And as I say, we have others. We have six packs of beer. We have things from Angostura. We have a robe from um, Bailey's as well. So there's lots and lots of fantastic prizes. And especially for that final on the 18th of December. Make sure you're here to support it with us and enjoy the football. Yes, yes. And, you know, be sure to wear your best attire and represent your team, folks. This is, it happens once every four years. This sort of tournament. Come on down. James is representing. I think I have a couple pictures from the last game, but I'll come all ready for the next game because it's a big secret. No big secret. I like Argentina. But anyway, back to the football. So the next game is, uh, you know, the World Cup darlings for some people. For some people. Brazil took on Switzerland in a game that was a lot closer than I thought. A goal from Casimiro really kind of separated the two teams, but it looked pretty narrow. It ended up 1-0 to Brazil, which, you know, basically secured their, their spot in the next round. James, not basically, it did. James, what do you think about Brazil's performance in this game? Well, I expected a bit more from Brazil. I mean, there's no hidden fact that we know Neymar was out with his injury. He may be back, obviously, into the, um, the round of 16 or the quarters, but they seem to lack a little bit of, um, not pace, but prowess, a little creativity. And obviously, with the exception of the goal, it was disallowed from Vinicius Jr. for that um, offside there. Obviously, Casemiro got the goal, but they just stopped and started. Rikalsen up front, he, he tried, he tried, but as I say, we talk about it, he huffed and puffed and couldn't blow the house down. And that was the, the, sto the story of the game for Brazil. I actually thought Switzerland were very good. Yeah. Um, Shaka had a good game in there. I thought um, Mbolo to me, I think, one of the things I've noticed with the Swiss coach, he seems to make these changes at strange times. I mean, I talk about it. Uh, I thought Mbolo had a good game. He took him off and then, the, the ones they brought, I think he brought on Fry and a few others, but they just didn't seem to have the same impact he did. I thought Fernandez was great at the back for um, Switzerland, and Jan Sommer had some big saves too, but I think, I mean, maybe there's an issue with um, Shakiri. He didn't feature today, so maybe there's an injury there, I'm not sure about it, but I thought he could have gave them something because Brazil really had an issue with their left back. Yes. And that's something we noticed before the tournament, mm -hmm. but Brazil got the victory, they'll be delighted with that and obviously they can move on. Yes, yes, and you know you highlighted the wing back as James said, we spoke about this before. Folks, if you looked at the Copa America, this is a very unusual problem for Brazil because Brazil has have always produced very powerful wing backs, you know, from Dani Alves going backwards. Now, it's interesting that, you know, I mentioned Dani Alves because he's included in the squad. He's obviously, you know, very old now. He's not the same Dani Alves as before. Now, I mean, Football now age, it depends on how you take care of yourself, but it seems to be a very glaring issue for Brazil. But you know, we'll see how that goes. Well, how my, uh, my only worry there is you say he's a little old, Andre, and he's the same age as us. So <laughs> I'm starting to get a little worried about you because, oh you know, I'm not going to tell the fans what age we are, but we're around that age too. Yes, so. yes, yes. Have some fun. Let us know what you think. How old do you think James is? How do you, uh, you know, let us know. That would be funny. Uh, so, you know, but interestingly enough, you know, that's a real problem for Brazil. And, you know, if you look at the stats, you know, they had 13 shots versus six, five on target, uh, you know, 54% possession, 46. You know, those of you who looked at the game, we saw some chances, you know, for Switzerland. But, you know, I, I hate to say this because it's not very tactical, but, you know, Brazil has a lot of strong players, Vinicius Jr. and all these attacking players, you know, uh, Gabriel, Jesus and all these guys. Yet, it seems as if, you know, and maybe I'm harping on an old stereotype here, but you know, long gone of the days where they're just going to flare the victories. And Neymar wasn't there today, so do you think that would have made a difference? I think it would have. I think he gives them that little spark of creativity. I mean, we know he's um, he's a player with lots of flair, lots of skill. We know he has that ego, and I think sometimes in these games that's needed, you know? Yeah. But I think they, they're, they're relying too heavily at the moment on, on Rakalsa. And I think although he scored nine goals in seven games, which is fantastic at the moment for Brazil, he just couldn't get, he didn't have any ability to support him. You know, I think Paqueta played, um, Fred played, obviously, Rafina, Vin Vinicius Jr. had a decent game, but they needed a little more. Yes. And just to push it over the line, as I say, I'm sure all the Brazil fans would have wanted a little more of a convincing victory to go into, as I say, the last game and then the round of 16. Yes, yes. And it depends on who you are. Some people, you know, would not care where they're in and they'll probably say they'll save their best for the knockout stages. Um, we've seen how that turned out in 2014. So let's hope it may not be this way for them, for Brazilian fans who are supporting them. You know, at the back, you know, they still have, you know, Thiago Silva, you know, who's up there in age. Still a quality player, but you know, what I would like to know is obviously they're getting to the group stage now. When they get, when they are playing in the knockout stages, will the age of the wing backs and these the obviously deficiencies in the wing backs and the older defenders 
and also maybe the lack of imagination in the midfield come back to haunt Brazil? Or just, is this a new Brazil that people have to accept now? What do you think? Well, I think, I mean, looking at the squad, they do have, I mean, they do have some players with age there. Yeah. And I don't think they have backups, really, yeah. that are, and I'll say, they maybe have backups, but they don't have capable backups. Yeah. And when you go into a tournament list, you need that experience. I mean, we could see it, we, we see Portugal have it, we see Germany have it, we see Brazil have it. Um, so, you need that experience, and I think, even although some may say they're over the hill, I think they'll do well to go through this tournament, but I think, obviously, as we know, this will be their last tournament, you know? Yeah. So, so, it'll be enough now, but they'll have to start looking for replacements sooner or later. Yes, yes. I know Switzerland played the 4 2 3 1, which seems to be a very safe formation for coaches. Um, what do you think Switzerland should have done more to maybe nick a result here? Well, I think they needed to be a little bit more pressing. You know, for example, what I noticed is their defensive se defense seemed to sit deep when they were going forward. Yeah. Now, like I always say, we are 4 2 3 1. If the defense squeezes up, you know, has a high block, for example, on the halfway line, it squeezes the game. Now, yes, you could then obviously be susceptible to a long ball over the top, yeah. but Jan Sommer's a good goalkeeper. I mean, oh, he kind of has a super, goal, super keeper as well. Right. So they should be able to soak up that pressure in that way. So I just think the defence needed to squeeze up. Yeah. The midfielders needed to go on the ball a little more, but as I say, taking off Mbolo at that time had a big impact on the game. I thought the players that they brought on, they were not as good as he is. He brings something, something very different to the fray. And I mean, the other thing I have to note in these games, there's a lot of pressure on the goalkeepers. I was thinking back to Allison. There was lots of time he getting pressured on the ball, and he actually made a few mistakes. Yeah. And he's a goalkeeper that doesn't make mistakes. So the game is very highly paced. So by pressing players, especially in a 4-2-3-1, you know you're going to get you're going to get chances. Yep, yep. So you know this is a interesting thing. We'll speak about the groups afterwards. We'll summarize the points and see how you know it's going to work out for everybody. The permutations and the calculations, folks, to get fancy. So you know we're going to head across to the next game. Uh, you know, before we talk about that game, you know, obviously it's Portugal versus Uruguay. But James is wearing his flashy attire, folks, uh, from the kind folks of Football Planet. And they've been able to supply us with this beautiful jersey. It's a player fit. If you want to get those jerseys and, you know, look as fresh as James and me on Argentina the game days, you know where to go. We'll be give some information below. So, you know, let's head straight into the uh, game, James. Uh, Portugal edged Uruguay 2-0 in a game that was a lot closer than I think James and I would have liked because uh, I really thought Portugal would have maybe... It would, okay, that's not true. I probably thought it would have been close, but it really looked at one point that you know Uruguay it was going to be a share of the spoils. So it was 2-0, two goals on Bruno Fernandes, one was a penalty, one was a ghost goal apparently. Cristiano Ronaldo, James and we will have some fun with this, you know, Cristiano Ronaldo was celebrating, enjoying, but we all saw in the replay Bruno Fernandes, but you know, tactically, you know, I'll ask you about that guy. I think Ronaldo's movement caused the goal. So let, anyway, let's talk about your first reactions to this game. Well, I think you're right. This game was a lot closer than we thought for long periods of the game. I think it took till the 55th minute, I think, for the goal to go in. Mm -hmm. But um, Portugal obviously edged the game, but Uruguay will be heavily disappointed. You know, they had a lot of chances. I thought um, Costa in goal for Portugal. I mean, I was highly critical of him in the last game. He came up massive in this game. He had four or five big saves. There's one that he stood up so big. He did well, um, and the player hit it at him, but that's part and parcel of the goalkeeper. You have to be able to make those big saves at the, at the right time, which obviously gives your team confidence. He did that. I thought Bruno Fernandes was fantastic. And contrary to what people think, I thought Ronaldo had a lot of influence in the game. You know, um, obviously he looked for a penalty at one point, he didn't get it, but I think he didn't get it probably because, you know, he's done it so many times, they don't even look at it now, you know? Yeah, yeah. But it was a, an even contest for periods of the game. Uruguay will feel they could have got more out of the game, but as I say, the, the Ronaldo ghost goal, which will credit obviously to Fernandez, which yeah. obviously rightly so. I think if Ronaldo maybe had a little more hair, maybe I should I need that too. He would have got the goal, but um, but I think he did have an impact on the goal because if he hadn't went up for it, maybe the goalkeeper would have seen it a little easier and maybe the save. So he did have an impact on the goal too, and obviously a wonderful penalty um, to finish off the route, but. Great performance from Portugal, they'll be happy and they've sealed the place obviously already in the next round. Yes, yes, and you know some good insight from an actual goalkeeper focusing because you know a lot of people are like, oh, you know, whatever, but you know that's a very interesting point that you made. And you know, just to build on that, you know, Uruguay is a team that tends to, you know, I follow South American football a lot. This is the post Oscar Tabarez era. Um, they I always call them, you know, 
you know, rightfully or wrongfully so, in my eyes, the Italians of uh, South America, because they have really good attacking players. You know, even the Suarez and Cavani are up there in age. They have some really young attacking players. You know, they have Vecino who plays for Inter Milan, you know, Godin who has experience. Yes, he's up there in age. I mean, Musolera didn't play, but, uh, you know, I feel as if Uruguay is a very reactive team. They always start off, let's shut the door first. And then only when their backs are against the wall, then you start to see their attack and play, uh, play. But to be fair, they did create a chance with their guy save. But what do you think about that? Well, I mean, one thing I was going to say is I think they played the game too much like a Copa America game. Yeah. They came very physical. I mean, there was some flying challenges. I yep. mean, I think Ben Tanker in midfield, you know, he was, he, there was a challenge that, I mean, on another day and another competition, he maybe could have seen red, you know, but the tackles were flying in. Valverde, um, even Nunes showed his presence up there. And I just think that they, they focused more on the physical aspect of the game instead of the technical aspect. If Correct. they had a focus on the technical aspect, they may have got those goals. Correct. But again, I mean, I think um, they hit the post, actually. Gomez had a crack. Beat Costa, cracked the post. So on another day, some of these chances may have went in. Like I say, um, Costa, the goalkeeper for Portugal, had a phenomenal game. I mean, I don't know who I'd give man of the match to between Fernandez or him. From a goalkeeper perspective, maybe he would, you know, just scrape it. Goalkeeper but union folks. Fernandez, you know, had a great game as well. Yes, yes, I agree. And this is why I started it off like this thing where Uruguay extremely frustrating because they can't play they have the players to play that system but it's ingrained in their dna that's how they play and you know to be honest in, in hindsight when they look back now they probably probably ruined those chances with the brilliant save from the, the portuguese keeper it's faster um you know but it was a lot closer than it looked and in the end portugal got the job done so, I yeah. think I think another talking point would obviously be Epi coming in today. I think he came in for Pereira, who yeah. broke his ribs, we saw. Yeah. But I think he had a very decent game. He's another player who's pushing at an age. I think he's 39 and 250 so many, so many days. So he's, he's very old mm -hmm. in football in terms, you know? And, um, but he, he didn't put a foot wrong, you know, in the game. He organised, he obviously took the captain's armband when Ronaldo went off, but he'll be delighted with his performance. Uh, a full 90 minutes under the belt. Yeah. And he will go into, obviously, looking forward to the around the 16 feeling confident yes yes you know so you know we'll end things off with just a quick run around with the stats so 15 shots for portugal 11 for uruguay three on target for each team 60 percent possession for uh, for portugal the reason why i bring this up you'll see and 40 for uruguay now the reason why i brought that up certain periods in the game the portuguese mid midfield looked like they were kind of lost a little bit and that's when uruguay started to gain a little bit of ascendancy at that point in time and then you know uh, what do you think about that phase, uh, phase of the game, and also when the Portuguese coach brought on his substitutions, were they the right substitutions, and did they push the game in Portugal's favour back from Uruguay? Well, I think obviously they started with Neves and um, Carvalho, I think it was, in the middle there. I don't think they had enough, personally. I think we spoke about this off air, you know, they're missing that centre midfielder. We talked about Moutinho, for example, who he's getting on in age as well. Maybe he could have done something in this team. Yeah. Um, I can't remember the other guy um, who played in the Euros, did very well. Um, but to me, those players maybe could have scraped into this Portuguese squad because mm. I think they bought on Polino at the end there, but they just, they lacked the quality that the rest of the team has. Yes, yes. So if they had that player that could, or, or maybe the fact is they could drop Bruno Fernandes a little deeper because they have offensive players and that might give them that little bit more domination in the middle of the park because I just think they still lack that. And when I think about going on in the competition, that's an area they're going to have to win. Yes, yes. And you know, just to end things off before we wrap the show up today, you know, formations wise, Uruguay played with three at the back. They started with Diego Godin, Godin and these guys who are experienced a little bit up there in age, but I understand why they played that formation. Portugal played the 4 1 2, well, basically a diamond in the middle with two forwards to Ronaldo and Felix, who's a player I think is really good, but he just hasn't hit that, you know, mark yet. So, you know, uh, James, just to wrap it up quickly. Formations wise for both teams, did you think that uh, Santos for Portugal got his formation right or maybe he should have done something differently? No, I think Santos did get the formation right. I think he lost that midfield battle in the centre, but I think it was the right formation because I think the way that um, Uruguay were trying to play, they obviously have that front three, you know. Um, it gives obviously space in the middle, but I just think Portugal just lacked that little extra touch in the middle. But the players that Portugal have, obviously Ronaldo up top, uh, Felix, Fernandez, Silva. I mean, they've got so much quality. I mean, I have to say, I'd expect a little more from um, Silva, to be honest. I think when he plays for Man City, he's phenomenal. 
he needs to up his game for, for Portugal probably. Yes, yes. So, you know, folks, you know, let us know what you think in the comment section below. We're now going to talk about the groups pretty quickly. That's how we summarize our shows now. So, obviously, let's talk about Group G first. Brazil are on top with six points. Switzerland have three points. Cameroon have one. Serbia have one. So, obviously, Brazil are through to the next round with a game to spare. Switzerland have the three points. So, you know, they were a little unlucky. They probably could have nicked something today, I think. Uh, but, you know, teams like Cameroon and Serbia, who do you think now, as the group is shaping up, is going to make it through? I think Brazil is kind of a foregone conclusion. Well, to me, it's definitely got to be Brazil and Switzerland because, remember, Brazil will play, I think it is Cameroon, maybe in the last game. Right. I can't see Brazil lying down for that one. And, yeah. obviously, a victory for Cameroon would put them, you know, on paper at the moment, then above Switzerland. But yeah. then Switzerland plays Serbia, and I think they'll win. So, to me, all day, every day, it's Brazil and Switzerland. Yes, yes, I think so. It will, it'll take a lot of mathematical things and things to go their way for Cameroon to get through, which is unfortunate because they are a very good team. So, folks, I go with Brazil and Switzerland as well. We're going to head across to Group H. Portugal, obviously, secured their three points, which is six points. Uh, Ghana has three points. South Korea has one. Uruguay has one. And, you know, James, today, obviously, Uruguay, they're stuck on one point. I think they needed that three points way more than, you know, maybe a draw would have not been bad for Portugal. So, does Uruguay have any chance of coming out? Portugal is already through. So, do you think Uruguay or South Korea can come in? Well, the interesting thing, Portugal played South Korea in the last game, so yeah. again, I can't see South Korea getting anything. So it comes down to that last game, Ghana against Uruguay. And it's going to be whoever wants it on the day. I think Ghana will scrape it after what I saw today in the games. But again, you just don't know. If Uruguay was to come up with a big victory, they may have a chance. Yes, yes. So we will see, but my heart says and my head says Portugal and Ghana. Yeah, my, I think so as well. You know, like my brain logically says those two. But, you know, based on how this group is set up, especially for the second spot, it's very unpredictable. You can't really tell who's going to make it through. And that's why we love this game, because you can't really tell. Nothing is really set, so you're going to have to look at all the games with us. And we'll have some watch-alongs, folks. We've been trying to do it for a while now, but we'll definitely do it for a couple of the games where you can... James and I will sit down. We'll have a live comment section. We'll even uh, choose, uh, you know, some, throw some questions in there. And we'll have some fun. And see James and I sweat when we look at certain games or laugh. Or we'll just have fun. Join in the conversation. If you can't physically be here with us, we'll do some of those. And when you're done, come down to Smokey and Bunties and have a drink. And remember, Andre, we have a huge game of football again tomorrow. But remember, it's a different format in a sense. Tomorrow we have two games at 11 o'clock and two games at uh, 3 o'clock. So we have tomorrow at 11 o'clock, simultaneously, Netherlands against Qatar. At the same time, folks. <laughs> Ecuador against Senegal. So that's at 11 o'clock and then at 3 o'clock. We have Iran against the USA, and we have Wales against England. So a massive day of football again tomorrow. I can't wait. I, I, I wish we could do a watch along to one of those. Obviously, it's going to be a little difficult for a lot of the fans out there because you're going to have to watch two games at the same time. But that's football. We love it. We want to see more, and we hope we'll get as much goals as we got today. Yes, yes, we'll find a way. So, folks, don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment on our YouTube channel. Check out the social media for Smokey and Bundy's and EXTV. Also, James, tell the lovely folks we're on television as well. Well, yes, we're with our good friends in Suriname, QNM Sports TV. Obviously, check them out if they're in Suriname, and obviously, our friends here in Trinidad, ME Television here in Trinidad and Tobago. As they will pop up the app um, address there so you can get it. If you don't have cable, you can download the app. If not, watch us on Digicel Channel 20 and Flow Channel 111. Yes, yes. So, folks, once again, James, we're going to end things off. Thank you for watching. We have all those games tomorrow, and James. Let's tell them to join what it is, the greatest show on earth. I love when James says it. James, you're going to have to end it off and say it, folks. Well, after a great day of football, make sure you tune in tomorrow and watch the greatest show on air. That's right.